So did anybody get the uh, hint uh, last week on why we're talking about Jupiter at Christmas time? <laughs> what? Bingo. So I had watched, actually Gayling got me this a long time ago, and I found it was interesting, and last year my family rewatched it, and it talks about one person's search for the Star of Bethlehem. And based on this, I did some other research and put this together. But if anybody ever wants to watch, borrow the video, uh, let me know. It's very interesting. One man's a lawyer's search for the Star of Bethlehem, basically. So uh, if we take a look at uh, Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. And the search for that star has went on for a very long time. Uh, and there's some interesting stuff. The people, Herod's people did not recognize that there was some big event. So how can you have something as significant as that star that triggers them, but yet nobody else realized anything interesting was going on. So, in biblical times, there was two types of stars. So that's kind of an important thing. If we just start looking at it today, we're probably looking for an actual star or shooting star, which throws us off course. So, in biblical times, there were stars that were constant in their motion, moving across the sky slowly, corresponding to the Earth's rotation and its rotation around the sun. But then there were stars that wandered and moved about independent of most of the other stars, which today we call planets. So in 1609, in a time when most people still called planets wandering stars, Kepler published the first and second laws of planetary motion, which are still used by NASA today. He used his math to try and find the star of Bethlehem and published on his work in this area. But he never found it. It was a time where it was very intensive to calculate any specific night, and with what we believe today, he was looking at the totally wrong time. He used the writings of Josephus, which said that Herod died in 4 BC, so that Jesus had to be born, after, or born before that. Well, it turns out when scholars very recently did a survey of the very oldest copies of Josephus, they found something interesting. He dated Herod's death at 1 BC, so then they started trying to figure out why do modern copies say 4 BC, but the original said 1, and they figured out that in 1544, a typesetter goofed up the date, and all copies made after that year were showing the wrong date because they were all based on his work. So they set up Kepler for frustration, and he never did find anything that he thought was probably it. So today with computers, anybody willing to pay about $5, which I did last year, can check a picture of the night sky at any date, any time, and any location, with, which is where I got these uh, pictures that I'm going to be showing, is I just captured them off my computer. But that software is still using the exact same math that Kepler invented. But to uh, back up for a minute, uh, most people believe that Job is the oldest book of the Bible, partially because he talks about the long-lived still among them. So post-flood, long life rapidly dropped off, but at the time of Job, they still talk about the fact that these people are with them. So one of the oldest books of the Bible, if not the oldest. And in Job 9, 5a and 9, it says, He moves mountains without their knowing. He's the maker of the barren Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south. So note it mentions constellations. So we know that they've been known from the very earliest biblical times, long before Jesus was born. So if you take a look uh, back at September 11th, 3 BC, at the time of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, there was a conjunction or meeting up of Jupiter and Regulus. And Jupiter, way back beyond biblical times, uh, or the time of Jesus was born anyway, uh, it was always known as the king planet because it was the most massive. So uh, even though some today think there's a larger planet, uh, which had a brief mention in the video I played last week, uh, which would have to be way out because its gravity hardly would touch us. So to have a more massive planet would have to be furthest away. 
But from what has been discovered and seen today, Jupiter was known as the largest planet or the king planet. And then Regulus was known as the king star in the most ancient languages, including Roman. So pretty cool that these two met up, the king planet and the king star, but this could have happened three different times during an average life. But what was different about this time is that Jupiter, a wandering star or planet as we say today, went into retrograde and from the point of view of the Earth, it went backwards. And then it did it a second and a third time. So three different times, it backed up and met back up with Regulus again. And we know in the Bible that when something's repeated three times, it's used for emphasis. So it looks like something interesting happened there. What's more, this happened within the constellation Leo. Leo's a lion, and a lion represented the tribe of Judah in scripture. So Genesis 49.9, you're a lion's club, Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a lion he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? And one verse later, we know that Jesus was co to come from the tribe of Judah. So verse 10, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Add to this that Jupiter was beginning the conjunction with Regulus, another constellation rose in the east behind Leo, and that constellation was Virgo the Virgin. When Jupiter and Regulus were first meeting, Virgo rose, closed in the sun with the moon at her feet, it was a new moon. I ring a bell to anybody? If you look at Revelation 12, 1 through 5, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, 10 horns, and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. So, as John said, the moon was at her feet. You can see the lower arrow there. It was a new moon symbolically birthed at the feet of the virgin. I don't know if those previous versions are traditionally used for the birth of Jesus, but it is interesting how it lines up in the night sky. I do know that Church of God Pastor Wally Winter has stated that he believes this part of Revelations is historical, not prophecy. Uh, but I kind of wondered about the dragon part that it talked about until I remembered Matthew 2, 13 and 16. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and return there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. So Herod kind of playing the, maybe doing Satan's will at that point. And then the snatched up part further in Jesus's life would be Luke 24, 51. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and he was carried up into heaven. The last time that everything lined up on that constellation wise was August 5th, 3915 BC. But this time Saturn was under the foot of Leo and some think this might have been the fall of man with Satan representing, uh, with Saturn representing Satan. 3915 BC, roughly fits the timeline. Genesis 3, 14a and 15, so the Lord God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. But going back to September 11th, 3 BC, this seems to be a signal for something important. So it could be the birth of Jesus, but it doesn't fit what we see everything else being. So it could be perhaps his conception or when the angels visited Mary. But anyway, nine months later, June 17th, 2 BC, Jupiter, the king planet, joins Venus, the mother planet, being so close that they appear to be one star, the brightest star anyone had ever seen. Likely, that's where the birth of Jesus happened. Matthew 2, 9b, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. 
So December 25th, Jupiter reverses direction in relation to the other stars to stay right over Bethlehem, at least from the point of view where we know the Magi were coming from. And just as the Magi observed while traveling, by now, Jesus would be perhaps a toddler about six months from birth. So it's kind of interesting to see how stuff lines up right around that period, whether that's the actual star of Bethlehem, I don't know for sure, but it is interesting to contemplate this time of year. <laughs> 